Well, I really appreciate uh, being here. Looking forward to I've been here. The Can you hear me well if I use the, yeah? Maybe I don't need this thing, but you can hear me well with the camera? All right, that's good. Um, so I've been on board since, uh, since May, so I'm about four months in. So I'm working my way around campuses, and this is the first time I've really been in southwest Georgia, so I'm excited to see it. It was, it was lovely kind of driving through the countryside today and uh, get, brought back some good memories. So. All right, so what I want to do is to talk about um, what it is that as a system we might do to try to help many more Georgians be successful in college. That's sort of the fundamental idea that in 2025, what we would like to see, at least the data suggests, that about two-thirds of jobs in Georgia will need some kind of post-secondary credential. So, in other words, about two-thirds of the adult population in Georgia will need to have a post-secondary credential in 2025. And right now, we're in the mid-40s. So what are ways in which we might be able to think differently about higher education to enable many more students to be successful? And of course, the bottom line of it is to help many people to be successful who in the past have not been successful. So underserved populations in higher education of the last 50 years, I don't need to tell you that there are significant equity gaps in education for students of color, students of poverty, adult students, first generation students. What are strategies that we can use large scale to be able to make impact in that work? Does that make any sense? So what I want to do is to show you at least some, what it is that we have learned, what are ways in which we might be able to understand what the data says about creating significantly clear pathways to success. And so a lot of the work that I've been involved in over the last few years is to understand what the large-scale phenomena are. Well, first of all, what I want to do is to show you at least something of what does it look like to be a student at a campus like this. So as I'm, as I'm, as I'm, showing, you the, I'm showing you this animation of the life cycle of students. So the green students, they went on to graduate. The red students, they did not go on to graduate. And this chart is showing moment by moment the likelihood, the probability that that student will actually graduate from the degree program they're currently in. So, you know, the kinds of questions you should begin to ask is, well, what happens when those students are taking that sort of nosedive like that? What's going on? Are there ways in which we can understand what that phenomena is? Are there ways in which we might, if we understood those phenomena, be able to change that? Does that make any sense? Yeah, so, so here's what we know. That there are strategies, that there is data, that there are things that we're able to do. The bottom line of this is, and you should be happy for me to say it, I think, that in the end, students have to do the work, right? It is important for them to learn the stuff. They're not going to be successful in your discipline or anybody else's if they aren't able to learn the material and do the work. The trick is that it is also the case that there are strategies that we can use. There are things that we can do that significantly change their ability to be able to do that. And that's what I want to talk about today. Ways in which we, well, whilst maintaining significant academic rigor, just as we do now, we still would be able to help many more of them be successful. So what does the data say about these pathways? So the first thing is, structurally, what can we know about the way that the curriculum is set up? So I'm a, I'm a mathematician by trade. And, and so this is, a, this is a graph. I'm actually a graph theorist by trade. I don't know if there are other mathematicians in the room. Is there anybody here who's a math? There you go, look at that, all over there. So, so I'm a graph theorist by trade. And this is, this is a network, this is an understanding of the system-wide curriculum. What I did was to take all of the courses that anyone has taken and graduated from USG over the last decade, so there's about 26,000 such courses, and then all of those are on this diagram. So they're all vertices on this network. And then what we did was join together the, the, the courses that appear together on a graduate's transcript. And the reason why we did this is because this graph has a well-understood structure. That structure is what's called a small world graph structure. And over the last 10 to 15 years, mathematicians have been able to understand what are the, what are the phenomena that, that actually 
play out on a small world graph? What are the features that we might understand about a network like this? Because I mean, the reality is otherwise, what I've just described is kind of a fun thing for a mathematician to do on a rainy Saturday afternoon. But other than that, why would you want to do it? Right? So here's what you know. Small world graphs, the structure is largely bound up by the vertices that, are, that appear the most, the hub vertices. But, but the influence is pretty surprising. That if I go to this graph and I delete just some of the vertices, if I delete some of the ones at the edges, the small ones, not much happens. If I delete the ones in the middle, the large ones on this diagram, I've just the, the more they're involved in that transcript, the bigger and greener they are. If I delete those, I don't have to delete, delete very many of them before the whole thing just falls apart. Just a few will do, five or six. Same kind of idea, people have looked at viral spread on a small world graph. So if I infect a small world graph with a virus, again, what do you think happens? Well, here's what happens. If you infect one of the small vertices, not that much happens. The virus just kind of dies out. But if you infect one of those hub vertices, the whole network becomes infected almost immediately. Very different phenomena because of the structure of that small world graph. So this is the transcript graph. So what I want to propose is that that phenomena playing out across our curriculum what does it tell us about the influence of those hub, those hub and critical courses? What it says is that in those critical courses, those ones that are right there at the hub, success in those courses leads to further success. Right? The whole curricular network gets infected by the, the successful learning, if you like, and spreads out across that network. Conversely, lack of success, lack of success quickly leads to ongoing lack of success. And I think many of us have had students in our classes, at least for a short time, where we know what that looks like, that they're there for a while and then they're not there anymore. Does that make any sense? So probably it's the case that you could write down what the courses that are in the hub are. Right? Those are what we often call gateway classes. I think we used to call them gatekeeper classes, but now we're more enlightened. Right? We call them gateway classes. But what I want to propose to you is that it isn't just that that's where everybody is, right? It isn't the case that just the case that, that there are, those are large enrollment freshman classes, but actually in a curricular sense, the, the learning that happens in those classes is foundational to the material that you learn throughout the rest of your degree. You know this. But what's more, the success of that learning actually significantly influences the likelihood of success later. So. We're going to use that strategy as we scale other initiatives across the system. That as we, in the next round of Affordable Learning Georgia, in the next round of the, uh, the Gateways to Completion project that we work with with the, with the Gardner Institute, that we will be focusing on those courses on each campus that are part of that, that central hub, the most critical courses in, in that sense of success in those courses, breeding success, lack of success, leading to lack of success. Not because the other courses don't matter. Of course, that's not true. All of the courses on that graph, they all matter. But what we know is that what happens in those courses disproportionately influences what happens in all the other courses in that foundational kind of way. Do you see what I mean? Of course, we will also learn. We, we will learn along the way. We will understand strategies that help students be more successful in those courses. And that similarly will influence learning across other courses too, but that's the reason why we will begin by focusing on those courses that are in that, in that sort of that central hub. And we've done, I've done that analysis every campus, every degree program to understand what are the courses that are, the courses that sort of carry the, the basic flavor, the basic fingerprint, the basic identity of success in each particular, uh, in each particular discipline. It's probably not going to surprise you that math and English are are in that central group. Sometimes I say, you know, math and English are kind of like the Kevin Bacon of curriculum, right? They're right there at the, right there at the center of what's going on. So what I want to show you is, is what it looks like, the difference between the, the graph being, being spread out with success and the graph being infected with failure. So uh, let's see how the, the lights work with this. What I've done is to take 10,000 students 
from across the system. 2,500 green ones, and the green students, they actually passed both their math and their English in their first academic year. Right, so they passed English 1101 and a credit-bearing math class in their first academic year. The, the blue students only passed the math class. They, they did not, by the end of that semester, have credit for, the, for English 1101. The, the yellow students, by the end of the year, had credit for 1101, but were unsuccessful in getting a math class on their transcript. And then the red students on the far left, uh, those students at the end of a full academic year had credit for neither. Yes, sir? Are these people who passed math and failed English or passed English and failed It's a math? fabulous class. So that's a question. The, the answer is it, it, it isn't that they attempted it and failed it. It's just that at the end of the academic year, they don't have that on their transcript. So maybe they failed it. Maybe when I was at Ole Miss, it was, Sadly, too common that students in the spring of their senior year were finally doing that math class, right? And so maybe they're that. But, but either way, they, didn't, they just don't have it on their transcript. And, and, and again, it's crucial that we're talking about that first academic year. It may be that they attempted them later, but then that they, they would be in the appropriate place. And also, I've sort of evened the pool out by preparation. So you shouldn't think to yourself, oh, all the better students are on the green end. Of course they do better. We've, we've even the playing field for preparation too. So watch, watch now as you see this, as, as they gradually float up, those students are amassing student credit hours towards their degree. And every now and you'll see a sort of a, a little flash of white. And that flash of white is students fading out. That's when some students are dropping out. Does that make sense? You can imagine going to my laptop and kind of rolling over each individual student. You can see their face or something. It's not true, but you can imagine it. <laughs> As they get to the top, they graduate, right? And you can see on that bar chart across the top how those different student populations <coughs> graduate at different rates. Remember, we, we began with 2,500 of each. And so in the end, those differences are presumably due to that difference in, in their success early. So here we are after 12 semesters. You can see the green bar is twice as long as the blue or yellow bars, and the red bar is way behind. That makes sense? The differences, I think, though, are pretty surprising. Would you have expected it to be the case that the green students would then graduate at twice the rate of the yellow or blue students? Twice the rate. And there's a tenfold difference system-wide between the green students and the red students. Tenfold difference. Let me play it one more time. And this time, can you see, you can hopefully see kind of a, a dim red bar, yellow bar, blue bar, green bar. Can you see that? I put that in there because I want you to see as the students disappear. So I've just shown you what it looks like with the students who make it all the way to the end. This time I want you to see it, what happens. I want you to concentrate on how quickly students kind of bleed out of the system. Watch the red bar and look how quickly those red students drop out of the system, literally bleed away. See how quickly that red bar drops down. End of the second semester, more than half of them are already gone. Those are the students who are unsuccessful in, unsuccessful in the sense that they, they don't have that math and English class as part of their successful studies in that first year. It, it looks like this. Right? Here, System-wide, this is what it looks like. 6% graduation rate for students who are unsuccessful in math and English. 66% gradu graduation rate for students who are successful. This is what it looks like at Georgia Southwest. Same kind of picture. Numbers are a little bit different, but you can see the same kind of phenomena. 6, 68. Very, very, sorry, 8. Actually, I think that's an 8, isn't it? Yeah. 8 and 68. So a good, an, an eight-fold factor of difference. So I don't know what, what kind of phenomena you were expecting, but at least when I did this initial study, I expected there to be a difference, but I don't know that I expected there to be that kind of profound difference. And of course, what I'm showing you here is also true for those other courses that are part of that central hub. That's what su success or lack of it looks like as it spreads out across the rest of the curriculum. You can see why it is that we want to pay so much attention there. One of the strategies that we're using to try to improve outcomes in math and English, as well as the work in Gateways to Completion, is this idea of co-requisite remediation. And I know that this is happening here in both math in the math department and also the English department, but I want to show you what that looks like system-wide. 
because I, I know here actually the numbers are relatively small, the numbers of students who are going through this remediation. Across the system, there are literally thousands of students who begin in the two different kinds of remediation that we have traditionally used here. One kind where students begin in some kind of a foundations course, and then having passed it, they then go on into the credit bearing class. And then the other is this new style of work, which actually is happening here full blown, is that students, they, either way, they begin in that credit bearing class, and then are required to also have some intentional supplementary instruction to enable them to be successful in that class. What I want to do is to show you what that looks like now system-wide. What I've done is to take the last, actually the last three years of data, so going all the way back through 2013, to show you the different stages of that evolution. Back in 2013, we had here in Georgia a very traditional approach to developmental education. Standalone developmental class, then followed, or perhaps sometimes a sequence of them, followed then by the credit bearing class. You can see the blue bar there. If you can't see the number, it was 20%. So 20% of students who began in that developmental class by the end of the academic year had passed a credit bearing math class, 20%. When we move to the foundations approach, that's the greenish bars. So that's the data from 2015-16 and the data from 2016-17. And you can see the 20% increased up to about 30%. Well, you know, 20 to 30, that's, 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 a, that's a significant increase. But, but the red bars are what happens when the students go through that prerequisite approach, where rather than a first this, then that kind of remediation, instead it's in parallel, it's just in time remediation. It's a coordinated supplementary effort along, alongside that student's work. And you can see those students are passing that same credit bearing math class, not at 20 or 30 percent, but at 66 percent. It's a profound difference, really astonishing difference. I'll tell you, I, so I also did this work when I was in Tennessee. What we saw there were changes that were exactly the same. There's nothing different about this phenomena here in Georgia, or Tennessee, or Colorado, where they're also doing this work, or West Virginia, where they're also doing this work. Everyone is seeing the same kind of improvement. It's hard work to do, but the payoff is enormous. What's more, you can see that this, these gains are not only true at the top end, right? So it isn't only the students who come in better prepared, although not as well prepared as we would like. All the way down to the left, you can see all the way down to the left are students who come in with an ACT score below 14 on their math. And yet, two-thirds of them are still passing their math class in that requisite approach within that academic year. If you don't like ACT, I have this chart for SAT. I have this chart for high school GPA. I have it broken out by race, age, gender, income, anything that you would like. They all look the same. Because it's important for you to know that as a system, and I know this is true here too, we are committed to all of our students being successful. So it's no good having a strategy that only works for this kind or that kind or the other kind. We need strategies that work for all of our students. And what I'm happy to tell you is that the prerequisite model is the best strategy that we know right now that works all across the student population. And what we also know is that this is not, this is not just isolated to success in that particular class, but it is also success which carries on to subsequent classes. And that's important for us to know. It's also true in English. So this is what the results look like in English. Again, moving from a success rate of four, roughly 45 up to a success rate of roughly 75. But again, the gains all the way through the ability spectrum, all the way across. Now, as I say, this is relatively small here. right? So you don't have so many students who are part of that requisite model, but one of the reasons why I wanted to show you is, well, first of all, for you to realize that you're part of that work, part of a successful new strategy, and it's important for you to know it. And the fact that, again, this is not talking about slight increases in student success. These are huge increases in student success. But more, the fact that the strategy in and of itself is a really useful strategy to know. So other disciplines that are other than math and English should know that this kind of effect is, is, in, is in place. So actually, so this is a slide of what happened in the Tennessee Board of Regents system. I was in Tennessee before I came here. 
And the universities there implemented a model that's reminiscent of this co-requisite model with their students too. The idea was that they took that credit-bearing math class and added a required lab component, and that lab component for students who were more poorly prepared, and that lab component was required and helped those students have that support structure that enabled them to be successful. The blue bars, the blue bars are before they did that. So the blue bars are what you get when you teach a class and then, and then you have tutoring over there in the library. Or maybe you have a supplementary instruction experience. Or maybe you have, you know, peer, peer tutoring. All of the different kinds of tutoring things that happen across a campus. But they're voluntary. Right? So you say to students, we have support. There's a math lab. There's all these different kinds of things. And you're welcome to use all of those resources. Good luck to you. Right? That's what you get with the blue bars. With the green bars, green bars is what you get where you say, you know what, you weaker students, you students who we know and you know and we know are going to find this course really challenging, you are required to go through this coherent and intentional support experience. We're going to hold you accountable for doing it. And now suddenly success rate goes up from 60% to 75 this is not, I believe, limited only to mathematics as a successful strategy. But there are many other disciplines where we might do well to see students who we know because of some predictive, some predictive measure would find this course very challenging, that we would require them, again, not just voluntary, not because you, know, you can go if you'd like to, but a required and intentional support experience to enable their success to a greater degree because not only do we want them to be success successful in that class, but success in that class leads on to success elsewhere. Does that make sense? So this is an important strategy for you to, to have in your back pocket. And again, just to hammer it home, this is what it looks like across the system when students are successful. The success in that math class, this is a bar chart of the proportion of classes proportion of the tempted hours that are, end up being earned. You can see the students who are successful, largely they're successful in basically everything that they're taking. On the other hand, the students who are unsuccessful, what we now see is being unsuccessful in that co-requisite model is not, not really because they can't do math or they can't do English. Instead, those students are largely completely disengaged from campus experience but those students end up earning no credit hours because of the fact that somehow something is leading them from not being, either they are not students, they're students who are in college, but they're not in college, if you know what I mean. Some of you do know what I mean. Yeah. Either that happens, or also a completely realistic situation is that life happened. Right? They had best intentions, but in the end, something, you know, they had some significant life experience and life got in the way. And so, but either way, they ended up at the end of the semester not passing everything but their math class or everything but their English class, but actually being unsuccessful in basically everything. So ways in which we can recognize that engagement issue, finding ways in which we can attach people more effectively to their degrees are ways which can improve that strategy. So next week, and I, I, I don't know who from this campus is coming, but I know there are people who are coming. Next week we will have the first of two academies, uh, a co-requisite academy in English on Tuesday and a co-requisite academy in math on Wednesday, where we're going to dig deep into this stuff. So teams of faculty from each campus who are teaching in that co-requisite strategy who will come together really to swap and, and learn from one another about the best practices that are happening and also to share system-wide data about exactly what it is that's happening across the system and ways that we might be able to learn from that and we will continue to do this. So each semester we will bring that, those groups of faculty together to create that in continuous improvement cycle so gradually over and over we will be able to improve that implementation. Again, that's important to do in and of itself, but I think it is also the case that other disciplines in this room will be the gainers from that work because lessons that we learn in those disciplines, well, they will be lessons that will be useful across many disciplines, I suspect. We talk a little bit about focus and purpose. Uh, 
as students are walking along a degree pathway, it's not easy to walk along a degree pathway for I don't know. Right? Who here has ever had a student where you ask them, what's your major? And they go, well, I don't know. Ever happened? All right, so here's what we're learning about this. What we're learning about this is indecision is, is actually sort of a sign of being human. Because what we've, what we've recognized is the fact that as humans, if we're faced with a large number of choices, actually more than a dozen is enough, but my suspicion is there's more than a, a hundred degrees on this campus. If you're faced with a large number of choices and one of those choices is you can choose later, then you will choose later. Many people will choose later. Unless there's a good way to be able to make the choice. And so guess what? On this campus and campuses across the system and campuses all over the country, many students come to campus and say, I don't know what I want to major in. And that, that choice is dis disproportionately true for students of color, students of poverty, and first generation students. So here's the kicker. It turns out to be the case that that choice, and it is a choice, a choice not to choose is a choice. That choice to say, I'll just choose later, turns out to actually put you at significant risk of choosing anything at all. In fact, in our system, when you look system-wide, more than half of the students who come to campus undecided, they actually drop out of higher education entirely before they choose anything at all. And the fact that they come undecided in and of itself is a significant impediment to their continued progress. Because in the end, you will only really work hard when you understand what it is you're trying to work towards. And what are you trying to work towards when you don't know why you're here? Does that make any sense? Yeah. So, one strategy to this is to stage the choice. That rather than asking people, okay, you know what? Which of this list of a hundred things do you want? Instead, you say, you know what? You can't be undecided. You can't walk in and choose nothing at all. But what's more, we're only going to ask you to make as much of the choice as you can make right now. So can you at least tell me which of these large-scale affinity groups, I don't know necessarily we use that terminology, but you know, which of these kind of stick out? Are you interested in a health profession or business or a STEM field or social sciences? And what we found when we did this this, has been, this work has been done elsewhere, is that overwhelmingly students are able to do that. In, in Tennessee, where I was before, we actually required students to make that choice at summer welcome. Either they knew a particular program, in which case go ahead and do it. But if you don't know your program, we're going to sit down with you, we're going to help and talk it through and find out if one of those things is a viable choice for you. And what we found was that less than 1% of students said, well, yeah, you made me choose. That's why I chose. The other 99%, they all, they all were able to choose. They all had a rationale for their choice. Either they, it, lay an interest, it satisfied an interest of theirs, or there was a well-paying job over there, or they knew somebody who did that. Whatever it was, there was a realistic rationale on their part to understand this is where I'm going, this is why I'm going there, this is how I'm going to get there. And then we were able to construct an initial pathway which enabled them to be able to make a more definitive choice. Right? Deliberately curate the fall and then perhaps the spring to enable them to be able to refine that choice down to something that was more focused, more particular. Or actually maybe to just rule it out. You know, I'm sure that there are, you know people who thought they wanted to be a teacher, but then when they got in the classroom realized that they just don't like children. They like their children, they just don't like other people's children, right? Or, or, or somebody who really thought they wanted to be a nurse until they saw that that meant they had to like touch people and blood and stuff and then they realized maybe not, right? So sometimes, sometimes disciplines are not the way you thought they were and it's important that that's part of it too. But regardless, deliberately crafting a choice architecture that enables people to have that definitive direction rather than walking in and being content to say, well, I just don't know. You know, part of this is to realize the power of that. So again, 
This is what it looks like in state universities, and I'll show you, actually, maybe I'll just go straight on and show you what it looks like here. This is comparing graduation rates for students who during their first year study at least three courses that they would naturally identify with what it was that they thought they wanted to study. So in other words, what, does it make a difference whether you, right from the very beginning, feel like you're studying what you thought you chose? Right? And you can, turns out there's a change of phase at three. So fewer than three, this effect disappears. But three or more, it really works. So the red students, those are students who in their first year of study did not study three courses that were you know, reasonably connected that they might say, oh yeah, that's a businessy kind of class or a STEM kind of class or a humanities kind of class. The green students, they passed those three classes. And probably it's a, I mean, it's a really deep observation to make for you that students who pass classes are more successful than students who don't pass classes. I'm sure you're astounded by that. It's the blue bar which is the interesting thing. That those are students who just attempted the classes. Some of them, of course, pass the classes, which is good. But the blue bar, that's an advising issue. This is the way in which we construct our, 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 our degree programs to make sure that intentionally, I know that I've learned as part of today that your first year experience courses are sort of flavored by major, right? Well, that's a really cool idea because it really is the case that right from the very start, you now know that your students, all of them, have one course where they feel like, ooh, that's a nursing-y kind of class, or a STEM kind of class, or a biology kind of class. They feel like they're part of that community. So I want you to start to think, well, what are the other two classes that those students might do as part of that first year? Because we want them at the, the end of that year to feel like they really were studying and making positive progress. Of course it's the case, this is not in any way speaking against general education and the importance of it. But that's not the same as somebody really feeling like at the end of the year they really were studying the thing they thought they chose, why they came here, what we want them to do. Part of that is math, right? So not only because I'm a mathematician, but there are other good reasons to think about math. It is the case that over the last half a century in this country, everyone has understood which math class you should take, right? Because it's in the name, college algebra, right? But as mathematicians, we know that that's wrong-headed thinking. College algebra is a course which was deliberately crafted to give people the algebra skills to be successful in calculus. So it makes sense to take college algebra if you're headed towards calculus. It doesn't make sense to take college algebra if you're not headed towards calculus. And in fact, all 17 math associations nationwide all affirmed last year the statement that Students at college should study the mathematics that is pertinent to their discipline, not just college algebra because there's college in the name, right? So that's an important observation because, again, this is an advising issue. This is about changing a culture which has been in existence for a very long time that everyone has sort of defaulted to this general idea that, well, you just take college algebra. Whereas in fact, and again, go back, to the, go back to all that we've seen today. The idea that math was important is not so you have a grade on a transcript. It's the learning that took place that those mathematics skills are crucial to you being successful as you work your way through across the rest of the curriculum, right? Well, so if that's true, it should be the right math. So it's important for you to begin to ask yourself, well, which one is the right math? And can we make sure that our students are in there right at the very beginning in a strategic way. This is all part of a much larger phenomenon, which again, I'll just kind of touch on here. During this fall semester, we actually gave a system-wide, the first time I think that we've ever given a system-wide survey. All the entire incoming freshman class, we surveyed with an instrument that would measure their academic mindset to understand how, as learners, they felt about themselves and the learning environment around them. Did they perceive the purpose of the coursework where they were studying? Did they feel that they were part of the community that they were? Did they feel like they were engaged on that campus? Did they feel like they could really learn this stuff? Or did they feel like people like them just could not learn this? Yeah. Did they say, I'm just not a math person? And so consequently, 
the fact that they identified in that way infringed their ability to be able to learn math. Same with English. Did they, did they feel confident about interacting with people like you? Did they feel like they could just walk up to you and talk to you? Or in some way did they feel that they could not do that? Again, this is nothing, not a reflection of you, a reflection of their perception, their feeling, their mindset about their environment. And then how about their grit and perseverance? Are they the kind of person who would kind of hang tough when going gets tight? Or is it the case that when a barrier gets thrown in front of them, then they're going to just fold? Or actually, more importantly, is it the case that they have what it takes to dig in hard and do the deliberate practice kind of work, which is going to lead to their successful learning? Or is it, in fact, the case that the way that they approach their learning in inhibits their ability to be able to learn new things. Does that make any sense? Earlier work that I've done elsewhere seems to show that all of that work has just as much impact on student success as preparation does. So if you think preparation is important, and you should, this is, it seems just as important. What we will be able to do over this next year is to really learn, A, what are these phenomena is it true here in Georgia, just as it was in other states, that these kinds of non-cognitive factors really do play a part in student success and learning? And what's more, what are going to be the large-scale strategies that will allow us to be able to harness that and improve the, out, the outcomes for students? What's the, what's the co-requisite model for growth and fixed mindset? Right? What's the analog of co-requisite? You see, you see what I mean? Somehow we have to get to the bottom of that because we will be significantly the gainers for it. All right, well, the, the last couple of things I want to show you are, 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 the, are the last few pieces of this, right? To recognize that it's not all hunky-dory. I showed you right at the very beginning that not all students are successful, right? Some of them take that big nosedive on that probability chart. Well, what happens when, that, when they come to see you and that happens? Right? What do you say? You can't say, see that red dot? That's you. <laughs> you could, I guess. But it wouldn't get you very far. Because what would the students say? Right? What they would say is, well, what should I do? Right? What other program could I take? So this is, again, this is some analysis that I've done that shows that for many of those students, there actually is, at the top of that yellow column, another degree program in which the evidence would suggest they could be very successful. It's just they don't know what it is. And I think, at least when I was an advisor, I didn't know what it was either. Right? It's hard to know in, in what other discipline in somebody else's department, somebody else might be very much more successful. It's hard to know. But... What we also know is that unless we're able to engage students in those conversations, they will not change. They will simply stick with what they've got until they run out of time or money or energy or all three, and then they'll drop out and there'll be yet another student who has debt and no degree. So ways in which we can take this kind of information and put it into your hands at advisors so that you are able to have much more informed conversations one-on-one -on -one with your students about ways in which they can be successful. This is part of what it is that I would like to, to work with uh, to prepare. And, and similarly, to provide that information in a sort of a useful and granular kind of way. This is an example of what that might look like. But this is a student who, they want to be a nurse. Right? They came in and they opted for nursing. But you can see that they're not very likely to be a nurse. I mean, they can't be a nurse. And actually, my suspicion is if you asked them and said, look, you've got a one in a hundred chance of being a nurse, they would say, yeah, I'm the one. I'm that one. Right? So what are ways in which you might be able to rephrase the presentation of that question to present to them other options where maybe they could, ma they could major in elementary ed or social work or radiation tech or med tech or health sciences, each of those other disciplines, you can so, you sort of feel, I think, I think you can sort of feel naturally that each of those things has a sort of a nursey feel, right? They aren't nursing, but they aren't, they aren't art history, right, or physics. They have a sort of a, and you can formalize this idea, that there's ways in which you can formalize that kind of affinity of different fields. And what's more, 
Of course, it is the case that students in the past have made these changes. But students who were nursing students have actually changed major into social work or into these other majors. And you can see, so in the past, how'd that turn out? Yeah. And if that's been successful in the past, there's no reason to imagine that that might not be successful in the future. So again, we can now present to those students not only the degree programs where there's good evidence to show that they personally would be successful, but of those degree programs, which of those actually are in the sort of same corner as the one that they are right now and, and are perhaps sort of feasible and reasonable choices for them to take. I mean, they have to do it. And if they don't want to do it, how do we create a, a viable plan for them to continue with what they're doing? Because clearly what they've been doing right now didn't work. Right? But if they want to change, what's a viable choice? The last thing I want to show you is the power of changing the way in which we think about scheduling classes. So I think it's well known that part-time students do not perform as well as full-time students. Graduation rates nationwide and here are much lower for part-time students than they are for full-time students. So that's well known. There's been a lot of work here in this state for what's called the so 15 to finish, right? Taking classes in batches of five, 30 in that first year. And the way in which we often phrase that is that it's important to try to get students through more quickly. Now, getting students through more quickly is a good strategy. Here's the reason why. There's two good reasons why. The first good reason why is because in the end, I, call, I sort of talk about it as the sort of the, the, the waiting for a bus principle. For the mathematicians, it's a Poisson process, right? So the longer, you, the longer something takes, the more likely it is that something will happen. Right? The, the longer you wait for a bus, the more likely it is that one will arrive. The longer you take to do a degree, the more likely it is that at some point a life event will happen that prevents you from finishing it. So the longer it takes, the less likely you are to graduate. Fair enough? Of course, it's also the case that the longer it takes for you to graduate, the more expensive it is. Right? There's all kinds of life expenses that are involved in being in college, which also are part of those life experiences, the, the you know, ways in which you might not be able to finish. So that's one good reason why we might imagine that not studying as long is a good idea. But here's more going on. It turns out there's more going on. In this analysis, we compared students who are statistical twins, right? Use a, what's called a propensity score kind of approach. Students who took 24 hours in their first year with students who took 30 hours in their first year. After that, whatever. But in their first year, 24 versus 30. To what degree were the students who took 30 more successful? Were they more successful? Turns out the answer is yes. And so this is in, uh, this again is in Tennessee. Surely there will be data for, uh, for Georgia. The students who took 30 hours are, we're, we're about 20 percentage points more likely to graduate. So literally take your graduation rate, add 20. That's what you get. So it's not small potatoes. Just taking those extra two classes in that first year somewhere. If they didn't graduate, on average, they got much deeper into their degree. So a good 20 or 25 hours much further into their degree. It is, of course, cheaper to take classes in groups of five. So from their perspective, the degree is 20% cheaper. Not a bad thing. Not a good thing if you're the CFO, because if every student's paying 20% less, don't we get 20% rev less revenue? Right? No, actually, that's completely wrong. It sounds like it would be right, but it's actually wrong. It's wrong because these students, because they're more successful, they keep coming back. Right? These are students who end up earning 20 more credit hours than the other students who didn't. Those 20 credit hours, they paid tuition for those. They were here. You see what I mean? So it turns out, and that's that bottom line, students who take those extra hours, their more success actually brings an increased revenue stream to the institution. You actually end up getting more money from those students. Now, I know as faculty, I don't know that you necessarily want to think of every student as bringing money in their hands. But it is the case that the money they bring pays for new lines and salary increases and all those things. And so money can be a useful thing sometimes. Right? So it sounds like it is the case that enabling students to take a fuller schedule, right, they're taking 9, take 12, they're taking 12, take 15, 
It is to all of our advantage. It's to their advantage because guess what? Actually, it's a student success initiative. We enable them to be more successful. It's to our advantage because their success is our success. It's what we're here for. And besides that, in the end, we have to keep the lights on and pay everybody, and we need financial stability, and this is the way to do it. Does that make sense? So as we're thinking about how to advise students, it is first of all the case that if in the past you have thought, ah, that's a weaker student, I'm going to give them 12, better not to overload them, you're wrong. The evidence is showing that that is wrong thinking, that they will be more successful with a fuller schedule than with a lighter schedule. It needs to be the right classes, but just the overloaded idea, although compelling, it turns out is not actually the case. But more than that, what as a campus we need to start to think of is how can we arrange the courses, the way they're scheduled and timetabled through the week in such a way that we enable more people to actually be able to take that full schedule. You see what I mean? Sometimes, of course, people will have they will have life that happens. They have children, they have jobs, they have all kinds of things. But it is in our interest to enable them to be able to create full schedules around those other factors in their lives. And we are advantaged by that, and so are they. So the bottom line of this then is to pull all of that together. I've shown you now a number of different strategies that in and of themselves do what we want them to do. They increase success rates, they level equity gaps. And those changes are not insignificant, right? Everything that I've shown you today, good, 20, 30, 40% increases in success. How can we pull it all together? The proposition is this, that we create an intentional, an intentional strategy on campus that pulls all of those strategies together. That every student, when they arrive on campus, has a purposeful choice. That as much of the choices they're able to make, either a program area or a focus area, of our specific program or one of those large-scale affinity groups, that they know where they're going, that we do what we can to create a positive academic mindset, that we get them engaged on campus. I've heard things ha talk, talk here on this campus about, for instance, commuter students who are utterly disengaged in campus life. They come on campus, they go to class, they get back in the car, they're gone away. What are ways in which that engagement can change the way that they feel about part of the community and now the data is suggesting that that is far from icing on the cake. It's an important factor in their ongoing success. That we have them attempt as much of 30 hours during that first year as we can, so we make it our business to schedule things in that way and advise students that as part of that 30 hours that they do what needs to be done to be successful in those initial English and math classes and also feel like they're studying what they thought they chose. And that all of that together not a menu, which of those would you like to do, but a recipe, all of that together in a coherent fashion. That's what we call this momentum year. What I'd like to propose to you is that each of those things individually moves the needle a lot. Together, we should expect them to move the needle tremendously. And so that's the challenge that I'm talking about all day here today, really. How we might do this together, both as this institution, but also together across the system. So I thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions that we have. Um, yes, sir. What are some of the other critical courses on that first multi-dimensional? Yeah, so the, the, the other kinds of things we see are, so initial sciences, biology, chemistry, so history courses are, are, are also in there. Um, so in, in many ways, it is exactly what you would expect. It is the, the, core, the core courses, but not exclusively those. So the other kinds of things you see are, on particular campuses, you see courses that are, they're core to that discipline, but not necessarily core to everybody. So for instance, uh, I know that you know, there's a prominent nursing program on here this, or on this campus. Wouldn't surprise me for anatomy and physiology to be in that list because it is such a crucial class to success in nursing. You see what I mean? So that varies a little bit campus by campus just with the, the mixture. You know, if you, if you had an engineering school, guess what? Calculus is going to be on the list. Yeah, but it's a great question. And we've done that analysis, so I, and, and I won't keep it a secret. Each campus, we will distribute exactly what that analysis says. Yeah, yeah. So I was encouraged by your uh, data on the co-requisite courses, but I was curious, who's teaching those? Is it faculty? Is it other student instructors? And does it matter? In other words, do students learn better from their peers? Well, and, and then that's exactly the reason why we're pulling these groups together to see that. So I can tell you what we found 
So what I found when I did this work in other states is exactly the way in which this is structured does matter. So, and, it ma and it's a little bit different by discipline. So in mathematics, for instance, what's, import what's important in mathematics is that the way in which those two courses are taught is that they are absolutely choreographed. They are absolutely in sync. And the, so it is less important in mathematics as to whether it's the same instructor or a different instructor. What's really important is that they are absolutely linked together and, and what the, the support class really, really does support the class it's supporting. And the other in mathematics is, is how important constant and regular feedback, personalized, regular and ongoing feedback and engaged, so in other words, it's a, it's a, it's a discipline of doing rather than watching. It's important for students to, to do it and get good feedback. More important that they do that than see somebody do it, do it for them. In, in, in English, it seems that the answer is that the picture is similar but subtly different. So it, the, the doing thing is important, right? So again, fresh, freshman writing skills, it's important for you to do it, not, not have someone talk about it. It's important to hear somebody talk about it, but in the end, you've got to do it. Uh, and it's important for you to get that good feedback so you can refine your writing. But it does seem to be in the case in English that there actually is advantage to having the same faculty member in, in both pieces. Not entirely clear exactly why that is, but at least the data is suggesting that you get somewhat better results when it's the same faculty member rather than different. There are institutions where they've used peer, mentor, peer mentoring. And again, the crucial element of that is training. You can't just throw students in there and go, you know, go get them. You go, it's all about making sure that this is a very intentional and choreographed kind of experience. But exactly what we're going to do in this work is to see what are the implementations that are getting the best results and what can we learn about the secret source and then spread those ideas around. It's a great question. Your, uh, one of the early charts you showed showed that the co-curriculum, co-requisite co courses had an extraordinary effect on students that were 14 or below yes. ACP. Yep. Uh, and and they, they, their success rate was very similar to 17, 18, and 19. Yeah. So should we, if we choose the co-requisite model, should we let students in that have a 12 on the ACP? I mean, why should we cap or, or limit who gets in? So this is, I mean, and, and I think this, you know, this, this is absolutely an area to explore. It's very clear that admission criteria in this system have been built by, built upon what we knew about previous success. And actually, I mean, I've already shown you that the way in which we decide which students go into remediation is all over the shop across the system. What we can see is, so there's two things we can see. First of all, that the prerequisite model produces success right across the preparation spectrum. That's an important thing to know. That's true in math and English. What isn't so clear yet is to what degree students who come in that poorly prepared can be successful in other disciplines, although there's reason to imagine that if they could be successful in those, that that success might breed onto others. But we absolutely, I think, need to look at why it is that we have excluded particular students from admission in the past. But what is clear is this, this decision about which students would or would not benefit from prerequisite support does absolutely need to be rethought. I mean, what you can now see, and it's perhaps not very surprising, is that essentially every student is going to benefit from having some, some extra support, right? We just can't give it to everybody because you just don't have that kind of resources. So what we need to do is to develop instead a mechanism where we've gathered the evidence of when students really, that support is superfluous. Yeah, they would, be gain, they would gain from it, but the gain would be negligible. But our assumption then is that students would benefit from having that support unless there's evidence to the contrary. And if there's evidence to the contrary, well, then go your happy way. But if you would benefit from the support, then as an, an institution, we partner with you and give it to you. Does that, does that seem reasonable? So I think part of that's going to come quite quickly, that we're going to revisit that kind of placement issue pretty quickly. The admission criteria, I'm open to those discussions. Yeah. All right. Thank you, sir.